thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of uh, background about the Crowd Content Consortium before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Jay Olfelder. So you'll get the context of what we're doing before we specifically turn to recent protests about Israeli and Palestinian issues. So the project was started in 2017. We sort of started it by accident, first counting the uh, first women's march. Um, and uh, Dr. Chenoweth and I uh, wrote about that, about the over 650 locations and three to five million people who participated in that. Um, we decided to continue the project after that, the Crowd Counting Consortium, but we expanded it to cover all kinds of uh, protests. And by all kinds of protests, I mean protests going all across the political spectrum, right, left, centrist, neither, uh, as well as um, protests all over the United States in, uh, in different places, protests, marches, demonstrations, and the like. Uh, in terms of the information that we have, we draw information from the, both the traditional media and from social media sources like um, X, like Instagram and uh, Telegram. Um, and uh, we collect information on a range of different details about these political events, uh, ranging from the location and the uh, organizations that are involved to crowd size estimates and the claims and issues that the protesters are uh, are talking about. And uh, Jay will talk more about some of the details you'll see with the particular protests that we're talking about today. Um, the project is a joint project of the Nonviolent Action Lab and the University of Connecticut, as you uh, as you heard. And our aim is both as a public interest project. Uh, we believe that the data that we provide is very useful to not only the media, but also the general public. And with a slight time lag, the data is available to the general public for the whole period from 2017 to today. And again, Jay will talk a little bit more about where people can access that information. But we also view this as a project for academic communities and scholarly communities. And we've been pleased to see uh, uptake of the data into research projects that are going on, both some of our own and also many projects of, uh, of others. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of sense of the overview of the project. And let me turn it over to Dr. Ulfelder now uh, to talk about the details about Israeli-Palestinian protests that have been going on in the United States. Yeah, thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, since October 7th, CCC's recorded nearly 2,600 U.S. protests, rallies, marches, demonstrations, vigils, and other actions um, in support of either Palestine or Israel with well over a million total participants across those two sets or waves. Um, importantly though, these events aren't evenly distributed across those two waves. While the pace and size of public gatherings in solidarity with Israel have declined significantly since the initial surge in early to mid-October, uh, actions in support of Palestine have swelled into a geographically broad and demographically and tactically averse movement that continues to produce scores of events with hundreds or thousands of total participants just about every day. Let's look first uh, in some more detail at the pro-Israel side of this mobilization. Um, from October 7th to December 3rd, this past Sunday, we've recorded 442 pro-Israel actions in 266 different cities and towns across 45 US states and DC. Uh, we have information about the crowd size for 312 of those events, or about 71% of them. And we conservatively estimate the total crowd size for those 312 events at about 293,000 people. Notably, about half of the pro-Israel events in our data set happened within a week of the October 7th attacks. A lot of the actions during that initial surge were large indoor vigils or rallies organized by faith leaders uh, and local or national Jewish community organizations. Lately, we've seen more outdoor actions led by individuals or community groups, and a lot of these have involved displays of empty Shabbat tables or empty strollers adorned with pictures of Israeli hostages. Throughout the period since the 7th, the dominant themes of these events, the pro-Israel ones, have been standing in solidarity with Israel, calling for the safe return of the hostages taken on October 7th, and pushing back against rising anti-Semitism in the, in the United States. Uh, over that same eight week period, we've recorded more than 2,100 pro-Palestine actions in 497 different cities and towns across 49 US states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and Guam. 
Um, North Dakota is the only state we haven't seen uh, one of the pro, any pro-Palestine actions in so far. And we have information about the crowd size for a little over, uh, well, for 1,182 of those or 56% of, of these pro-Palestine events. And we conservatively estimate the total crowd size for those at nearly 694,000 people. And as you can see in this chart, um, weekly coordinated days of action, which have included a school walkout in late October, uh, a global shutdown for Palestine on November 9th, and another shut it down for Palestine on the Black uh, on Black Friday after Thanksgiving. Um, these coordinated days of action have served as clear focal points for the pro-Palestine activism, but they're hardly the only times we're seeing protests. And in fact, we're still recording numerous pro-Palestine events across the country every day, and the crowd sizes at them haven't really shrunk all that much yet. Our data also show some interesting contrasts across the ongoing pro-Israel and pro-Palestine waves. Um, first, we've seen elected officials at a lot, uh, at a much larger share of the pro-Israel events than the pro-Palestine ones, almost 25% compared with uh, less than 2% of the pro-Palestine events. The elected officials we've seen at those pro-Israel events have also included a fair number of state governors and US senators whereas the highest level official we've seen at pro-Palestine events have been US representatives, and that's at just a few of them. While most of the events on either side of the wave have gone off without counter protests, we have seen counters at a somewhat larger share of pro-Palestine events than pro-Israel ones, uh, about 10% versus 7% specifically. In raw numbers though, that's 214 pro-Palestine events where we've seen direct counter protests versus 32 pro-Israel ones. Of those 214 uh, pro-Palestine events with counters, we've seen reports of physical scuffles or fighting at 27 of them, of injured pro-Palestine protesters at 10 of them, and of injured pro-Israel counter-protesters at four of them, um, including most notably Paul Kessler, the Jewish man who died after a scuffle with a since arrested protester at a recent event in Thousand Oaks, California. Of those 32 pro-Israel events with counters, we've seen reports of physical scuffles or fighting at four of them, no reports of injured pro-Israel protesters and reports of injured pro-Palestine counter-protesters at one of those. Uh, also on this chart, we've seen arrests at a small share of pro-Palestine protests, property damage uh, at an even smaller share. Almost all of the instances of property damage have involved graffiti. Um, and neither of those, that is, uh, uh, arrests or property damage at any of the pro-Israel events, not including the, the counters I was describing before. Zooming back out um, to the bigger picture, I think we're fairly confident at this point that this year's pro-Palestine wave is the largest and broadest pro-Palestine mobilization in U.S. history. Uh, CCC, as Jeremy said, has only been making data since 2017, so we can't directly compare this year's wave to ones before that, uh, like the one, for example, that happened in response to Israel's military offensive in Gaza in 2014. Uh, but as you can see in this chart, the 2023 wave is already much larger than the one we saw in 2021 um, over the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood and the storming of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, in contrast to the ongoing wave, that one in 2021, which seemed unusually large at the time, involved only several hundred events in total and faded fairly quickly from sharp peaks on a few early weekends. Whereas in 2023, we've already seen over 2,100 events and we're at eight weeks and counting. Uh, it's also pretty unusual to see a large, such a large and long mobilization focused on foreign affairs. Um, this chart's comparing the ongoing pro-Palestine wave to the wave of actions we saw after Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022. So similar to the 2021 pro-Palestine wave and this year's pro-Israel wave, last year's anti-war wave around Ukraine and Russia waxed and they mostly waned pretty quickly within a few weeks and comprised hundreds rather than thousands of events in total. In fact, this fall's surge in pro-Palestine protest is one of the largest mobilizations we've seen in the US around any political issue since the racial justice uprising of 2020, which itself was probably the largest protest wave in American history. 
Another of the big recent waves came last year in response to the Supreme Court's reversal of Roe v. Wade. Uh, and as this chart showing those 2022 protests around reproductive rights peaked sharply twice, once soon after the draft decision was leaked, uh, and then again when SCOTUS actually issued its ruling in June. But even with those two huge peaks, we logged fewer than 1,900 events against that ruling across 75 days, compared with more than 2,100 pro-Palestine events in just over 55 days so far this year, and, and obviously still going. One reason this year's pro-Palestine wave has gotten so large is that it's spread to so many towns, including ones that haven't traditionally mobilized around this issue. Um, as I said earlier, we've seen events so far in nearly 500 different U.S. cities and towns, and as this chart's showing, we're still seeing handfuls of new cities and towns joining that set nearly every day. In other words, cities or towns that hadn't previously had a protest on this particular issue uh, since October 7th. So clearly, this isn't just a big city thing, uh, and the movement's still spreading to new parts of the country, even eight weeks later. Neither is it just a college student or college campus thing. Um, this chart's showing a lot of these pro-Palestine events have, have happened on college or university campuses, uh, and in some cases in middle or high schools, but most of them have not, especially lately. We can also see the breadth of this movement and the variety of organizations that have been involved in these protests, well over a thousand of them in total by our running tally. Um, this chart shows in descending order the 25 organizations we've seen most often at the pro-Palestine protests since October 7th. Given the large share of events on campuses, it's not surprising that Students for Justice in Palestine leads the way here, uh, and that a few other student groups, including Students for a Democratic Society and Muslim student associations at various schools also show up in this set. At the same time, this list also helps identify three other leading streams of organization contributing to this wave. First are the various long-standing Palestinian and Arab and Muslim American organizations with local chapters across the country. So groups like the Palestinian Youth Movement, American Muslims for the Council on American Islamic Relations, and Palestinian Community Network. Second are the many socialist, anti-racist, anti-imperialist, feminist, queer, and other leftist groups that don't focus on this issue, but have long mobilized in solidarity with Palestinians. So here I'm talking about groups like the Party for Socialism and Liberation, Democratic Socialists of America, uh, various cities' anti-war committees, Veterans for Peace chapters, and the Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Uh, and last but not least are various Jewish-led groups, including Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, that have, uh, have long supported calls for Palestinian rights. These groups were less active in the first week or so of the, uh, of the current wave, but they really jumped in after Israel's bombardment of Gaza began in earnest in mid-October. Since then, they've organized or participated in hundreds of events, including lots of acts of civil disobedience in roads, train stations, or uh, in particular at the offices of elected officials. Dozens of those acts of civil disobedience have involved arrests, sometimes hundreds of them in one go, and we've counted nearly 1,700 total arrests at pro-Palestine actions so far this fall. <laughs> Since the start of 2022, um, CCC's also routinely recorded verbatim the demands and other claims that protesters make, uh, as evidenced by the signs, banners, flags, and chants we see or hear in photos, video, and other reporting from the events we track. We don't always have video or audio evidence from which we can capture these claims, but when we do, we record as many unique references as we can. And here by unique, I mean that we only record a single instance of any given phrase at a particular event even if it appears more than once. Uh, and the point of all this transcription is to enable us to analyze the character and evolution of protest rhetoric within and across movements, and importantly, to let the protesters speak for themselves um, on what their events are about. In the ongoing pro-Palestine movement, we've seen an expansion over the past eight weeks beyond traditional focal points of pro-Palestine activism, including claims about occupation, apartheid, and rights of resistance and return, to regular references to genocide and the need for a ceasefire to stop it. 
Um, so if the phrase free Palestine and Palestinian flags have been the common thread throughout this wave, the emphasis in other signs and chants has shifted over the course of the of, uh, of the last eight weeks from phrases like end the occupation and no USA to apartheid Israel to things like ceasefire now, stop funding genocide, bombing kids is not self-defense, and stop killing children. References to resistance still appear regularly, but a fair share of the recent events have focused exclusively on alarm over what protesters characterize as genocide and calls for a ceasefire. In addition to key words, we can also look at how often we see specific phrases. So this chart showing the 25 phrases we've seen most often at pro-Palestine events since October 7th. Um, and by far the most common claim here is also one of the simplest, at least rhetorically, free Palestine. Uh, also notable here, though, is the broad prevalence of the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, which we've seen or heard uh, in material, again, signs, chants and the like, from more than 400 events over the past eight weeks. Uh, while the Anti-Defamation League describes this phrase as an anti-Semitic one that implicitly calls for the destruction of Israel and violence against its Jewish citizens, a lot of pro-Palestine activists, including ones we've seen interviewed about it in videos from, uh, from the events we track, dispute that assertion and describe it as a positive call for Palestinian rights and freedom. Obviously, our data, ca uh, data set can't adjudicate that argument, but it can show just how common that call has been and what else is said at events where it's been seen and heard. Uh, last, this chart, like the previous one, also shows how prominent calls for ceasefire in Gaza and against genocide have been during this wave. So ceasefire or ceasefire now is the third most common claim, not far behind from the river to the sea. And it would jump to second if we counted phrases like Jews say ceasefire now along with it. Meanwhile, references to genocide, war crimes, and bombing children appear in several others. And we see a specific chant about President Biden cracking into the top 20 here as well. Um, at this point, you might be wondering why we haven't showed similar charts about rhetoric for the pro-Israel wave. I mean, we could do that in terms of generating them, but it wouldn't be very informative because the sample of events is much smaller and a fair number of those events were vigils or demonstrations that didn't involve signs or chants beyond Israeli and sometimes American flags, uh, kidnapped posters and variations on the theme of we stand with Israel. There's a lot more we can do with the data on this topic. Um, I wanna stop there for now to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, before we get to those though, I wanna show you where you can find the data as well as information about how to access and use it um, and how to reach us with questions. So the, the primary home for the data set is a repository on GitHub. That's, you're seeing the top of that page here. Um, as Jeremy said at the top, the data are freely available to all comers, um, no registration or anything like that required. Uh, and there are instructions on how to download the data set, um, as well as links to our data dictionary and coding guidelines uh, on that repository, where the code, coding guidelines are where you can find information about uh, the sources we use and the procedures we follow um, in making the data. The version of the data set that's available here is updated weekly on Wednesdays with events through the preceding Sunday. Uh, and it also includes some features we add. Google Sheets, I'll show you a snippet of in a second, um, uh, that make it a little easier to add, uh, analyze. And that's including tags for associated political themes, things like foreign affairs, reproductive rights, et cetera. Um, and IDs for counties as well as towns and states so you can filter things easily that way. The data set stored in that GitHub repository is an amalgamation of data we make daily, um, just more or less in real time in Google Sheets uh, where the sheets are organized by the month, year. Um, you're looking at the top of the, at least a couple day old version of the one for the current month uh, right here. Um, we also make those Google Sheets publicly visible, but um, we make them visible a few days into the start of the next month. So for example, the November 2023 sheet became publicly visible yesterday on December 4th. In both the Google Sheets and the compiled data on GitHub, we include hyperlinks to all the sources used in creating each event record. 
Um, that's mostly about crediting the sources and showing the provenance of the data, but those links may also be useful to you, to journalists, um, in cases where you want to take a deeper look at specific events. I think especially for larger protests, those sources may include photo or video from the scene that our structured data is only capturing the surface of. Finally, if you ever have questions about the data set, uh, what we're seeing as we make it or how to use it, um, please feel free to email me or my colleague, uh, Dr. Soha Hamam. Uh, and of course, you can also watch our blog where we publish occasional pieces on trends in US protest activity um, using uh, stats and charts similar to the kind of thing we've shown here today.